movement in Iran last year, let's call it the Revolutionary Women Life Freedom Movement of 2022 and 2023, um, was often compared by many Iranians, as many other movements have, to the uh, revolution of 1979. When such uh, comparisons are made, now whether favorably or unfavorably, i.e. either the movement is seen as sort of a negation of 79 or in some ways is, is compared with it, um, you know, when, when the case is latter, when the comparisons are made, these are often made strategically or tactically. You know, how was the, how did the leadership of the revolution came together in 79? How was it able to uh, help overthrow the Shah uh, and so on and so forth? So it, it's natural for a society to look back in, in its own history to find out sort of strategies and tactics. Um, but a different set of comparisons have been made uh, of late uh, to a different revolution in Iranian history, and that is the Iranian Constitutional Revolution of, of 1906 to 1911, that for many years now, for a few for the past few decades, has been something of a lodestar. Its anniversaries are often celebrated. The ideas of its thinkers um, have found uh, much more interest. You can say that there's been sort of a renaissance of studying it in the past few decades, um, uh, many excellent scholars like, like Janet Afari have, have done much uh, on this account, as have other sort of public intellectuals like Mashallah Ajudani and, and others. Um, in relation to the Women Life Freedom Movement, also, um, some of the eminent scholars who've made the comparisons between uh, Women Life Freedom and the Constitutional Revolution include folks like uh, Ali Mirsepasi, uh, Firuza Kashani Sabet, um, and others who've made these comparisons. So I want to make my own. Um, um, placing, if you will, uh, of the movement uh, Women Life Freedom in a in a long, uh, long longer dura historical perspective that would uh, look at it in relation to both 19, uh, 1906, 1911 and the um, uh, 2000, uh, uh, the 19, 1979 movement. And I want to do that in two particular ways. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, as a as a question of a national lineage, um, i.e., the lineage of a struggle for certain ideas um, like civic rights, um, like nation building, and that I'll talk about, but also in the interesting question of global context. In other ways, in what in what ways the global context helped shape these three revolutionary movements of 1906, 1979, and and 2022. Um, uh, and 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 I want to suggest that the way this this happens is different uh, for each uh, revolution. Um, now let me start with the constitutional revolution of 1906 or 11 because in its global context uh, it becomes very interesting when we put it in its global context. Um, uh, different scholars like uh, Turaj Atabaki and Janet Afari, who I mentioned, have talked about different borrowing of ideas that happens. Um, in regards to this revolution uh, and in some unexpected ways, while many usually uh, know it, uh, you know, use terms like Western ideas or Western liberal ideas, there's also many ideas who come, um, who actually come from uh, Ottoman Empire, India and other contexts. But um, broadly speaking, this period of history from, let's say, 1905 to 1919 is one in which many, uh, uh, many societies are, are very broadly defined as East, um, you know, using that term with, with reservations, but like I said, outside the Western Europe, um, many societies have um, have important revolutions that are similar. Of course, there's a uh, 1905 revolution um, in Russia, which is a prelude to the 1917 revolution. Um, there is the liberal revolution in Ottoman Empire in 1908. Uh, which is often compared um, and um, sort of uh, not only compared, but seen as a following from the Persian Constitutional Revolution. Um, and also similar movements later on in Egypt, China, Korea. And what they have in common um, is that there's often an attempt to pass over uh, from an imperial lineage to one in which uh, civic uh, uh, values uh, are important. Um, I would say that um, if... Uh, to use James Galvin's terms in, in 19th century, a uh, defensive developmentalism is used as a tactic to come up with the West um, uh, and, and be able to compete with the West. Here, a new generation of, of revolutionary leaders um, uh, instead believe that, um, you know, other than just sort of developmentalism, there's a need to actually 
uh, insist on on liberal and civic frameworks uh, in a way for this uh, for this uh, empires to pass into modern nationhood, if you will. And there are many different cases that I mentioned, but there's there's some similarities. So the Persian Constitutional Revolution, the Iranian Constitutional Revolution of in 1906 and 1911 comes in this uh, global context. Um, and I mentioned global context because uh, it's not just a matter of, you know, whether how much it influences the Ottoman revolution um, or how much it gets influenced from the Russian revolution that precedes it. I think it's more interesting to see that there are common answers to common problems. Um, and that's why um, they, uh, if there is a zeitgeist, um, they share it. And I think um, that's a, that's sort of very interesting fact. Um, uh, you know, remarkably, uh, in the woman life freedom movement today, uh, there is indeed a return to many of the ideals of the constitutional constitutional revolution. Um, I'll discuss in a second as to you know how we understand seventy nine in in between in this relation. But it's clear that uh, as I as scholars that have mentioned, like Mirza Pasi and Kashani Sabet and others have argued, there is indeed a return to the ideals of of those revolution. Uh, this includes both uh, civic rights and sort of liberal ideas, um, but also uh, attempts at, at, you know, I use the term nation building, which had a particular meaning in, in, in those times as sort of passing to modern nationhood. But at the moment, and I'll, as I'll discuss, um, as I'll discuss a bit uh, later, I think this is also a very important patriotic national element um, to the to the revolutionary movement now, which has to do with an attempt to let's say take back Iran, a term that is actually used by by some protesters today. I mean, an attempt to assert um, an Iranian nation that is very different from what the Islamic Republic um, has asserted. Um, but the global context is is remarkably different um, than than 1906 if we look at it. Um, if the constitutional revolution in 1906, especially in retrospect, but even from the perspective of the time, uh, in many ways seemed to be um, um, seemed to be uh, in in line with the zeitgeist. Uh, we live in a very zeit uh, different zeitgeist now. Um, I should also add that when I talk about civic ideas and liberal ideas. Uh, we shouldn't forget, of course, that there were many leftist ideas in the constitutional revolution, many and many leftist movements at the time. Of course, as Alfari and others have shown, um, uh, Russian Social Democrats, which are the future communists and uh, and and other parties that result from from that party and that movement, have an important um, uh, sort of relational role um, to the movement in Iran. Um, but broadly speaking, uh, the f even Social Democrats and communists in Russia at the time are fighting against the autocracy and for what you can say. Um, you know, sort of uh, civic rights, um, and in fact, in some ways, uh, I would argue, uh, liberal values. So that's, of course, the term liberal can be very contentious, but I use it, uh, by, but I use it um, in a particular way. Um, so back to uh, now, uh, global context of the woman life uh, freedom movement now, uh, and in a very different zeitgeist and a global context that it faces, I'd argue that um, it, it, um, its relation to the, the global context is, is as such. There is a rise of authoritarianism in a lot of places. There is democratic backsliding. The third wave of democratization is long over. Um, the previous rounds of democracy movement in Iran, let's say the election of President Khatami in 1997, uh, were sort of more in line with the global context in a way, um, although you could argue that by 1997, there was already a bit of a toning down of, of sort of the height of the third wave. Um, but uh, certainly now um, we live in, a, in an era in which authoritarianism is on the rise. Um, and I think this is not just a passing trend. I think it's a worrying and important trend. Um, and also as the unipolar, uh, the short unipolar moment of American supremacy gives it uh, gives its place to multipolar, to a multipolar world order. Um, and um, there are many different ideas to, to, to discuss this issue. Bruno Makesh has, has spoken of civilizational state, uh, for example. But a common line that we can we can find is that um, a lot of states um, like, like India uh, under the right wing nationalist government of Modi um, uh, and, and on other examples can be given. Even South Africa, let's say, under a, a left leaning social democratic rule of ANC, what they have in common is an attempt to assert their nationhood, um, you know, in a civilizational way, perhaps if you use Makesh's uh, framework um, on a world scale. Um, and this can have an authoritarian element to it um, because the idea is that priority uh, is um, sort of a strength and, and 
finding an authority for this for this nation on a world scale and as a result um the demands of those who ask for more equality and and and, and more democratic structures inside a country are are deprioritized um so there is something to this uh, authoritarian nationalism that is on the rise in our times um, and i've seen it in in other contexts you know turkey uh, is uh, under erdogan is probably a better much better example than 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 south africa um, and certainly Modi under India, uh, India under Modi, and uh, and other examples. Um, and I would I would say that this is a contradiction for the Iranian movement for democracy because such authoritarian tendencies also actually exist in the Iranian opposition. They certainly exist in the Iranian regime and not just in the person of Ayatollah Khamenei, which is very much a leader of the 1979 mold, but in other uh, sections also of the IRGC um, and, and other sections of the ruling regime, but also that of the opposition. So I would say that this is a a threat um, that that exists um, that, that for the movement. Um, but at the same time, uh, I would argue that the current movement uh, in Iran, the Women Life Freedom Movement, um, it's not accidental that it uh, that it adopts such a progressive uh, slogan, which it got from the Kurdish uh, movement, of course, in in, in Turkey and Syria. Um, but uh, it's not accidental. Um, what explains this seeming contradiction, the sort of rise of authoritarian nationalism, which I claim also exists uh, in the Iranian uh, sort of both regime and, and the opposition, but, but also this very sort of progressive unifying slogan. I believe the reason is that the actually existing civil struggles in Iran in the last two decades, these are workers' rights, women's rights, the environmental movement. Um, these have, you know, these have led to a very broad coalition for again, sort of civic values um, uh, and you know broadly sort of liberal values, um, you know that, that are really important and hegemonic um, in at least some spheres of life and and uh, an important part of of this movement. Um, if you look at the song Baraye by Sherwin Hajipur as a sort of a signifier and sort of the sort of values that are that went to in song. The song was of course made based on a crowdsourced um, a sort of collection of tweets. Uh, with his hashtag Baraye or four, who, which were collecting different demands of the revolution. So I think there's some some value to that. Um, you know, there's some analytical uh, value to looking at the sort of demands that made it to the song. Um, others can look at the broader uh, picture of the different demands that were made under this hashtag Baraye. You will see that a lot of them are on this of uh, this who basically of of civic rights and 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 and, and as such. Um, in and in my new book, what Iranians want: woman, life, freedom. Each chapter, I look at. Uh, one such movement, and I think this explains why um, there's this progressive civic values nature um, uh, to the movement. But at the same time, this was this is very much a movement to take back taking back Iran. In fact, one of my first suggestion for the for my book title for my new book title was taking back Iran because I think that's uh, you know that's an important element as well because one important protesting point by the protesters is that they don't believe the Islamic Republic of Iran represents uh, their Iranianness. This is, I think, a very crucial point, is that they don't just think it's not representative, but they really think it's not representing Iran. They think there's something um, something missing there. Um, there's some uh, contradiction. And I think when we look at the 1979 revolution, we can it can be as a key to uh, to uh, to this contradict to answer this contradiction why is it the Islamic Republic of Iran is seen not just as being non-representative but also as not quite being Iran um, and I think so this is important um, and 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 also it means that any future developments in Iran will have a period of haggling over this concept of Iran as a nation and what it means and what kind of values do we want this Iran to have now this brings me um, to my point uh, of of comparing the revolution of uh, women life freedom movement the revolution movement of 2022-23 to 1979 now i do believe as some protesters and and some in the iranian opposition have said that in very in some ways this uh, this new movement is a negation of of 1979 in some ways but perhaps the the ways in which i suggest it's a negation might be a little different from from others uh, because my reading of 1979 revolution and its global context perhaps might be a little different. So I'll try to um, offer my, my arguments there. Um, in short, I believe the key difference between 1979 and 2002 uh, is that um, 1979 was very much a movement for fundamental 
uh, revolutionary change projects, and by which I mean in line with what and others have called the long global 60s, this, this long decade, more than two decades, really, I take it from 58 to 79, indeed, of revolutionary experimentation in, in different parts of the world. Um, in line with that spirit, revolutionaries of 79 were, were happy to try um, and very experimental political projects. In fact, they were um, they belonged to parties, uh, each of whom had uh, one sort of experimental political project after after another. And they were really aimed at turning Iran, if you were, into a laboratory for a new man. Of course, there was the new communist man, there was a the new Islamist man, and then this particular phraseology was sometimes actually used uh, and sometimes not. But in the, so it was a revolutionary project in this way. Um, it was about turning Iran into a laboratory for this new project. And I don't mean that sort of in, in a negative way. Of course, this this is what happens with, with many revolutionary movements of the 20th century, sometimes with salutary uh, developments. So I think, the as I have argued elsewhere um, in my own work, the 1979 revolution has what I call a paradoxical centrality to the global 60s by which I mean that it is an end of the 60s in many ways, because the experiments end at this new Islamic Republic um, that is going to very much disappoint most revolutionary stuff founded, that, including Islamist revolutionaries. And an important point to remember, Islamist revolutionary founding fathers of 79 are very disappointed with it um, in various years. And in fact, the reform movement of 97, which culminates in the Green Movement of 2009, are also all ways of dealing with this uh, disappointment. And, and certainly the other... Um, its liberal supporters, its socialist and communist supporters uh, find their disappointment much earlier and, and with repression of the 1980s where thousands of them are killed, tens of thousands of them are arrested, hundreds of thousands of them are uh, demobilized effectively politically and, 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 and sort of uninterested and opposed to the republic that they had helped fund in 79 under the leadership of Ayatollah Khomeini, someone who they had all supported in, in for a variety of uh, periods now, some for some months, some for some years, but but they all had supported his leadership and his ideas for a change new regime at, in in some ways. Now the 2022 movement, in many ways, is the exact opposite. Uh, it also comes, as I tried to explain, in a different historical uh, global context. This is the very opposite of the global 60s. Um, if you uh, look at works of people like Vincent Bevins, who've looked at uh, mass protests of the 2010s. Now, Bevins is uh, who uh, has a very fascinating book, um, and he, I think, is mostly focused on how these movements are not able to reach their own goals. But I think another aspect that would be interested to look at these movements, and um, uh, you know, in countries like Chile, Hong Kong, um, Lebanon. Um, uh, and early on, actually, the Arab Spring um, in, in this de long decade of 2010s. Um, an interesting point here uh, is that they don't actually have revolutionary frameworks. That's what people like Asif Bayat has have sort of argued that these are revolutions without revolutionaries. Um, they do not want to turn their countries into laboratory for revolutionary ideas. In fact, they don't necessarily even have coherent agendas for revolutionary upheaval. Um, they sometimes have general justice seeking ideas or, or perhaps... Um, um, as especially the case uh, in my analysis of revolutions in Iraq and Lebanon, revolutionary movements in Iraq and Lebanon in 2019, um, and arguably even in Chile and, and Hong Kong and other places, these are basically revolutions for effective statehood. I mean, they want states that work, they want public services that work, and they want a national identity that is um, that is sort of coherent and not devoured by, um, uh, by uh, elements that, uh, uh, that have disrupted it. Um, so I think this is a fundamentally different global times, and so it partially explains how the 2022 movement also is fundamentally different. Now, I earlier talked about its relationship of the 2022 movement to its global context in a different way in relation to authoritarianism, the dangers that I think is there, but in relation to this question of, um, uh, you know, the way it compares and contrasts with 79, I think this global context is, is different. And we can see that the movements in Iran is also very different. In fact, if you want one slogan that is really direct, shows how different um, 2022 is to, and in 79, perhaps it's a slogan uh, called the normal life. Um, it's a very striking slogan, I think, that's used by many uh, people in this movement. I think it can be critiqued um, as well, uh, but it's fascinating that so many Iranians are just basically saying, we want a normal life. 
Um, of course, uh, what really counts as a normal life is interesting. And I think it's our job as, as, as scholars to look at the archives that are already coming out of this revolution to analyze and understand this. In my new book, um, I do a deep dive into a, a YouTube channel of Sarina Ismailzadeh, a young woman who was killed um, in the early days of this protest. And this really shows her outlook on life. I looked at her different YouTube uh, channels, Telegram channels, and, and all that she had uh, written. And it emerges that um, uh, her idea of a normal life, which is a term that she also used herself, is one free from harassment uh, by the regime, but also one in which she and her friends who are very diverse, um, they have different sort of, some of them wear the hijab, some of them don't. Um, they have different interests. They have, uh, you know, they like different uh, movies. They have different tastes. Um, it's sort of an idea in which free from harassment, they would be able to express themselves. Um, so I think it's this a slogan, a normal life, which would sound um, perhaps very simple. I think it has, in fact, a, um, a very radical um, element uh, in it. Um, so uh, I want to end by saying then that the 2022 movement, um, to wrap up and sort of reiterate my arguments, is indeed a return to the ideas of the constitutional revolution, A, because of its commitment to civic ideas and, and liberal ideas, and B, because it is interested, like, constitutional, like the constitutional revolution was, in reclaiming Iran and a struggle over Iranian identity, which I argue um, there are also dangers and pitfalls in this, especially given the authoritarian, um, uh, the age of authoritarian resurgence and nationalist authoritarian resurgence that we live in. I think there are dangers in this that will be important in future of Iran um, and dangers that to counter them, rooting ourselves in the civic movements that have existed in the past two decades uh, will be uh, important. And, and see, or my third point there is that what unites the constitutional revolution in a way with um, the 2022 and makes them different from 1979 is that the 2022 movement in some ways similar uh, to 06, um, definitely different from 79, uh, asserts not to, intends not to turn a country into a revolutionary project to a sort of a laboratory for experimental revolutionary projects, but for um, trying to sort of uh, reclaim civic rights, citizenship rights, and a normal life uh, for its citizens. And I think this is a, you know, this is what makes it unique and so different from 79. I want to add that I think it is possible to see, of course, a line of this, um, a sort of an unbroken thread, if you will, of demands for civic rights and for Iran national identity um, also in 79, so from 6 to 79 to 2022. But what makes 2022 fundamentally different and an undoing of 1979 um, is its different revolutionary ethos, its different revolutionary models, and the fact that it is it in a way that that is very interesting. It prioritizes life and and livelihood of citizens um, and sort of normal life of citizens and the diversity of citizens. Um, it prioritizes them um, to abstract uh, and sort of. Uh, revolutionary experiments and which from a, in a Marxist way, I can critique the global 60s revolutionary um, uh, laboratory projects as voluntarist. So if if the, in the global 60s and leading up to the 1979 revolution, we had a lot of voluntarism, we have its opposite, uh, we have its opposite in 2022. The challenge, however, I mean, I will end with this, the challenge, however, is for 2020 two movements, the current movement, which has gone on, you know, gone on defeat for now, is to be able to translate its non-voluntarist, its life-affirming, its sort of people-first, um, normal life-seeking um, ideals um, into a working revolutionary, indeed, um, agenda, ideology, and leadership. Because without that, uh, perhaps a little paradoxically, uh, it 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 cannot win, and 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 regardless of you know of what happens uh, in in the in the next few days or next few months or next few weeks, um, this struggle um, will continue in Iran um, for uh, for all the different causes of of different civic movements that have done the work in the last twenty years, um, that and then continue to seek a better, a more inclusive uh, Iran with more rights uh, for its citizens. Um, uh, you know, just just 
like the struggle has been going on since at least 1906 constitutional revolution and its ideas which remain um, unattained in Iran of today.